Welcome everyone to ISIS Parenting's Breastfeeding Webinar and Chat. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm a mom and baby nurse educator, board certified lactation consultant, and board certified in pediatrics. I'm here outside of Boston, Massachusetts at ISIS Parenting's home office. And with me today in the chit chat room is Hillary. So thank you, Hillary, for serving as moderator. And today we are going to talk about nursing older babies and toddlers. And uh, I think people know that here at ISIS Parenting, we have four centers in the Metro Boston area. We've just opened five brand new centers in Dallas and Fort Worth areas, and also four centers in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And I think joining us today are friends from Kennesaw, Georgia. So glad to have you at ISIS Parenting Kennesaw. Big shout out there. And it looks like we've got lots of moms with toddlers in the chit chat room today, which is great. So let's dive right into it, because as I just typed in the chit chat room a moment ago, babies do grow and turn into toddlers. And yes, they still breastfeed. And you'll be surprised <laughs> how quickly it goes. Uh, I do have a saying that an hour can feel like an afternoon and an afternoon can feel like an eternity when you're parenting a very young baby, but you blink and another week's gone by and you're going to keep blinking. And, you know, all the old ladies in the supermarket will say to you, oh, darling, enjoy every minute. It goes so fast. And, you know, you can't enjoy every minute. Every minute is not always enjoyable, but it is, and it doesn't feel like it's going fast in the here and now. But again, uh, your brand newborn turns into a smiling baby who turns into a, a crawling baby, who turns into a birthday boy, who turns into a toddler. And nursing may be still an important part of your parenting experience. Milk is part of a balanced diet. So Typically, while the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation is exclusive breastfeeding or breast milk for the first six months of life approximately with iron fortified solid foods added thereafter, and they recommend breastfeeding through the first full year of life and thereafter as long as mutually desired by parent and child, by mother and child. So they don't put uh, an outside limit on when weaning should occur. Now, a lot of people translate that to mean that breastfeeding should occur for the first year and then the child should be weaned after that. Uh, and I hear a lot of interesting questions that come to me on Facebook and Twitter about things like um, at my baby's 12 month checkup, the pediatrician said that, uh, that one of the reasons why she's not eating so much at meals or she's not drinking a lot of cow's milk is because I'm still nursing her three or four times a day. And he told me to start nursing her less so she would drink cow's milk or nurse less so she would eat more. Um, and really, milk is an important part of your child's diet, and it may be 50% of their calories and nutrition. So human milk is actually the best kind of milk for your baby, but there are other things that children will eat. Hold on, I gotta shut off my Twitter feed, which is going crazy right now. Stop. Okay. Um, so, babies drink all kinds of things. There's a difference between nursing a, a three-week-old or a three-month-old and nursing a 13-month-old. There's plenty of other things they can eat and drink. So they're not fully dependent on you for nutrition or for hydration and encouraging your baby starting at six or seven months to learn how to drink water from a sippy cup. And then at nine to 12 months, you can introduce a straw for fun. And between nine, uh, excuse me, between uh, 12 months to two years old, you'll be transitioning. They should be able to drink from a spouted cup, a straw, and an open cup with assistance. And um, of course, uh, what you put in the cup matters. So I'm a big fan of water. I drink a lot of water myself and I encourage parents to offer their babies water and get them used to drinking water because there's an awful lot of older babies and toddlers around who only wanna drink juice. And juice is essentially nature's Kool-Aid. It's natural sugar, but it's still sugar and it's bad for the teeth and it fills them up with a lot of nutritionally lacking calories. So I would limit juice juice to a, a special treat, maybe juice in an open cup at the table, uh, and it can be diluted 50-50 with water. So you could do two ounces of juice and two ounces of water once or twice a day at the table, as opposed to giving them juice boxes or sippy cups where they're bathing their teeth with a sugar bath uh, on and on throughout the day. So water in the sippy cup and um, milks can be introduced, cow's milk can be introduced after about a year. So before
per year cow's milk shouldn't take the place of breast milk or iron fortified formula. Um, and um, I won't go into it too, too much here, but uh, if your child seems very sensitive to transitioning to some cow's milk, if you've been using express breast milk or formula and they don't seem to like the taste of cow's milk, there's a lot of different things you can do. Like um, you can make, if they're used to drinking a bottle and the pediatrician says now it's time at 12 months uh, to turn them over to a cup, that transition may be sudden for a lot of babies. So you may need to do uh, first transitioning them from breast milk or formula to cow's milk and then gradually from the bottle to the cup. You don't have to do it all at once. Um, and two ounces of uh, breast milk and an ounce of cow's milk in a bottle heated, if that's how they have been taking their milk at childcare, uh, that will gradually get them used to the flavor of cow's milk and the digestive differences of it too. And then gradually you can increase uh, the ratio so that they're getting, for example, 75% cow's milk, 25% breast milk in a bottle or in a cup. And when that seems to be going smoothly, they'll probably take straight cow's milk. Um, most people will start the baby on uh, whole cow's milk or 2%, depending on what your pediatrician suggests. But if your baby is having difficulty with the taste and making that transition, you may actually want to try 1% or skim milk temporarily because the texture of it is a little bit more similar to um, the texture of breast milk that they're accustomed to. Whole milk tastes a little thicker to a baby, and so they may bulk at the difference in the, in the flavor and texture. I did want to just put a quick word in about other types of milks. I'm using that in quotation marks. Um, soy milk, rice milk, almond milk, and, and things like that. These are not actually milks. Milk is the fluid produced by a mammal. So these really should be called uh, rice water, almond water, soy juice from a, from a soybean, and so on. Um, these are not good substitutes for breast milk. They're not actually good substitutes for uh, cow's milk either. They have very different ratios of protein, uh, fat, and a lot of them are sweetened. Um, they generally don't have calcium unless they're fortified and so on. So um, there's not an equivalent just because we call these things milk doesn't actually mean that they're milk and they certainly don't have uh, the same type of nutritional ratios as human milk and cow's milk. Uh, do. Now, a good question. I was, I really wanted to get a picture of a breast and say, um, you know, with a, with a no expiration sign on it because breast milk does not have an expiration date and it still has great value even after a year. There's nothing about breast milk that says it's great for babies um, and it, it's, um, you know, it, it, it loses value over time. Again, it's the same, uh, the same makes me want to scratch my head when I hear the pediatrician say to, to cut back on breastfeeding so that the baby will drink more cow's milk. It just doesn't make sense. Um, human milk is species specific. And one very interesting thing is that you probably know that breast milk changes over over time in terms of the nutritional uh, components. And the milk a mom makes for a premature baby is different than the milk a mom makes for a full-term baby. And the milk you make at six months is different than the milk you made at six weeks. And the milk at 16 months is actually different too, because uh, as, as a toddler gets older, they tend to nurse less frequently and your milk production goes down a little bit and the milk itself changes and becomes more concentrated. So it actually has a higher ratio of fat and it has more antibodies in it. It actually concentrates the antibodies, the fats and the proteins. And another thing that human milk has is these amazing human uh, growth hormones, which stimulate your baby's immune system and um, their neurological development in a way that uh, artificial uh, other types of milks and cow's milk do not and cannot. Um, so breast milk always does have value. It has value as milk itself, but it has value as a species specific milk that is designed specifically for your baby. And here's something that's pretty cool to know. If your child is at a play group or uh, at child care and another child comes over and coughs or sneezes on them and exposes them to a virus, their body will begin to make uh, antibodies to that virus, but it's in their system, it's in their saliva. And when they nurse, they actually trans some of that virus to you and your body and your breast will begin to make antibodies to the infection and give it back to the baby or the toddler in milk 
So you can produce antibodies to a germ that you yourself are not even directly exposed to and give them back to your, to your child to help them fight the infection faster and sooner. Also, the question about does breast milk lose value after a year? I put this picture of dairy farm here because the milk we drink um, is expressed in a dairy farm from uh, a herd of cows, many of whom have been lactating for well over one to two years and then it's pooled in a giant cistern um, and then it is homogenized and pasteurized and bottled and transported and shipped and um, and consumed probably two or three or four weeks after it was initially expressed from a cow who's been lactating for uh, two years or longer. So why would we possibly think that this milk is, is more uh, appropriate for a child than the milk that his or her own mom is making? Breast milk benefits don't go away with time and um, the health benefits in particular. So we know that breast milk is dose dependent and the longer uh, you continue to breastfeed, the more health benefits your child gets in terms of cognitive development, neurodevelopment and immune properties. So nursing into the second year, in other words, after the first birthday, statistically these babies will have fewer ear infections. And of course you may have a baby who's had five ear infections and I'm sorry, but, um, but Statistically speaking, uh, less upper respiratory infections and far less gastrointestinal infections. Um, and um, also breast milk is uh, the best rehydration solution. So uh, if your baby, if your toddler has a has a vomiting and diarrhea, you don't need to reach for the um, the electrolyte solutions if your baby is still nursing. And sometimes when a baby is sick, a toddler is sick, he doesn't want to eat solid foods as much and may want to nurse more. Uh, and that's okay. You may find your supply come up a little bit if your child has just been nursing before uh, a nap or two during the day and at bedtime, and now all of a sudden he has um, uh, Coxsackie, which is um, hand, foot, mouth disease, and a sore throat, and a fever, and he's all cranky, and he just wants to nurse six or seven times all day long and not eat. You'll find he may get better in a day or two, and your milk supply takes another day or two to kind of calm back down again. Um, this picture of a cell is uh, actually called a phagocyte, and your breast milk contains phagocytes that are specialized white blood cells that actually seek and destroy viruses uh, in your baby's digestive tract. Very cool. Um, I think this is the first of some of the submitted photos I got uh, for this webinar. So this is a beautiful picture of um, a calming moment, and when you're toddler is out of sorts, when he's cranky and can't settle, when he um, falls and bumps his head on the floor, when you just need to take a breather and reconnect, um, nursing will still have that benefit. So just as it can be a very special moment to, to hold your three-month-old and cuddle your six-month-old in your lap and have them fall asleep nursing, that really doesn't change and go away. Your baby is still your baby. He's just bigger. Um, and he may be able to crawl or toddle over and climb up into your lap for a, cuddle, a special cuddle and snuggle and a nursing session. Um, but nursing sessions really can be uh, rejuvenating for both the, the developing toddler and mom. The health and environment benefits, the health benefits for moms are actually pretty astounding. So the longer you breastfeed, uh, the lower your risk of a variety of illnesses like breast cancer and premenopausal uterine cancer, ovarian cancers, endometrial cancers. So a lot of the uh, cancers of the female, um, uh, the female anatomy uh, are, are triggered by ex frequent exposure to uh, estrogen and things uh, like that. So the longer you breastfeed, you're actually reducing your risk of many of these cancers. And osteoporosis is a really cool one because uh, older, as women get older, they're at much higher risk of, uh, of osteoporosis, weakening bones, and hip fractures when they fall. And uh, it's, it's known that women that breastfeed longer have uh, le much less risk of these 
uh, hip fractures from falling. So that's a pretty cool thing too. It's true that when you breastfeed, your bones do decalcify a little bit to put calcium in the milk to grow your baby's bones. And the interesting thing is after you're finished breastfeeding, your bones actually get stronger. So they recalcify and they become stronger than they started out. So it is important that nursing moms and, mo and, and women of all childbearing uh, years and even after take calcium. Uh, make sure that you're eating foods that contain calcium or taking a calcium supplement to keep your own bones strong. Um, hopefully you're able to forego your period, your menstrual cycles, for a longer period of time when you're breastfeeding. I just feel so bad for some of the moms at six weeks and eight weeks who get their periods back. It just seems like such a ripoff. Um, but a lot of times uh, women can go six or nine months or perhaps longer, as long as 12 months maybe, uh, without getting their period back. And they're not breastfeeding constantly throughout the day like a mom with a newborn would be. So for example, a nine to 12 month old child may nurse, um, you know, it, it could be as many as eight or 10 times a day, but more typically, it's going to be more like three or five times in a 24-hour period, perhaps even less. Um, and still, if that keeps your prolactin levels high enough, it will uh, it will prevent you from ovulating and uh, you don't get your period. So that both uh, saves the wear and tear on your body. It's certainly pleasant to have a nice break from getting your period regularly. Um, and then, of course, all of the environmental stuff, both in terms of um, the fem feminine hygiene products, but also... Um, Longer breastfeeding saves the environment in terms of your own carbon footprint because of um, you know, the formula and milk, the packaging, the processing, the dairy farms, the trucking to get the, the products around and into the supermarket, and then all the waste of the containers that, um, that the milks are, uh, are packaged in. So it's a very green process. All right, so we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, what it might be like to breastfeed an older baby or a toddler because um, it's very different than breastfeeding an infant. And toddlers do begin to have lots of personality and willful behaviors and uh, can be demanding. And parenting is about teaching limits and, and teaching manners. That's certainly an important part of parenting. Um, and you can set limits on breastfeeding, when and where and how often and how much and what your baby does or doesn't do while breastfeeding. So, you know, I get lots of questions about um, about pinch the baby that pinches or wants to, we call it twiddling, when they want to hold the other breast or the other nipple uh, when you're nursing and so on. And these are all nursing manners, that you, they're table manners. And just like you're going to teach your older child some table manners about not throwing food and uh, not grabbing things off other people's plates and how to eventually use a fork properly and how to use a napkin to wipe their mouth, you're going to teach them table manners at the breast as well in terms of, of demanding behaviors. So you can set limits just like uh, you're not going to let your little one climb on a table and you're not going to let them grab toys from a friend. Um, and um, your child may demand uh, to nurse and they may demand cookies. And again, these are limits that you're going to set. So um, I did put a picture here. I wonder if people know who, uh, who that little girl is in the picture with the red dress. I bet somebody does. Um, but that's not the model child that you want to raise your child to be very good, Joanne. I want it now. Daddy, I want an Oompa Loompa. Um, so that I believe is uh, Veruca Salt, and uh, that was also um, a great indie band as well way back when. And um, yeah, you don't need you don't need your child to be one of these little um, demanding you know what's. So um, just like you will set a limit and not let your kid have a, a whole big uh, container of Coca Cola, you're gonna also um, offer them uh, alternatives when it is not an appropriate time. Uh, or you do not uh, want to be nursing. Um, definitely teach your child a code word, and uh, I'm a fan of using American Sign Language uh, modified, uh, so ASL or baby sign, which is modified uh, American Sign Language. With babies, this is something that you can start very early on. You're not going to expect that they're going to sign back until uh, somewhere around 9 to 12 months, but babies can sign far earlier than they can speak. They have the cognitive ability to communicate, but they do not have the verbal skills for quite a while, and they can use basic sign to indicate uh, their thoughts, their wants, their needs, and so on. Um, no child comes up with uh, all on their own, you know, mommy, give me boobies in the middle of Walmart. 
um, they learn that word from you. And so I don't know many moms who say, you know, oh yeah, you want your booby now, but you know, teach your child something appropriate. I like to call it milk because that's what it is for an older child. So, so starting around uh, six, eight, 10, 12 months, you can say, do you want some milk? You want milk? I used to say nursey, I admit it, but my son never yelled, nursey mom. Uh, but teach them the sign for milk, which is an open and closed fist. And um, look at all these gorgeous kids signing for milk. They'll tell you what they want. You can teach them milk, please. And that way, if you are in Target and your and your um, your 15 month old is tired and cranky um, and um, wants to be held and keep saying, you know, milk, 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 um, it doesn't seem so odd. Um, teach them the sign and a decent word. Okay, uh, and then speaking of being at Target and having your baby want to nurse, uh, where and when you nurse, the, the limits that you set, those are up to you. And that's a parenting style thing, and um, everybody's going to have a different viewpoint on that. Um, but you can keep your baby close and wear them in a carrier, and sometimes just that closeness meets their needs when you're out and about. Some people will sit down in the park and nurse. You can use a sling or a, a front pack, and that can can help them. Uh, it, it may not, it doesn't necessarily make it more discreet. What it can help with is the toddler gymnastics of your, of your child kind of um, popping on and off and running off and coming back and so on if you're, if you're in public. But some other options are to offer your child a tempting snack. So if you do want to create a, you know, give them a diversion, make sure you've got things handy in the diaper bag that are tempting diversions to them. So uh, the little cup of, uh, of crackers or a whole grain cereal, um, an alternative drink, uh, a sippy cup with water or with diluted juice or something like that in there. Um, and some people will make a special place to nurse and that's the nursing spot. So it may be as your child gets older, you may choose that you don't want to necessarily be out and about and nurse as often as you did when your child was uh, an infant. And so in the home setting, for example, you may only nurse on a certain couch in the living room or uh, you can, I cover this more in the gradual leaning webinar, but a lot of people will, um, they don't want to be a sitting duck. In other words, every time you sit down, the toddler runs over to you and tries to climb into your lap and nurse because sitting down triggers that desire to nurse. And so so um, you may say, oh, well, you know, we can go upstairs to the boring rocking chair where we sit and nurse, or we can go to the kitchen and have a snack and do a puzzle at the kitchen table. What would you like to do? So you can make nursing a little bit uh, dull, boring, and only occurring in a particular place, and then offer tempting alternatives if that's what you would like to do. Um, which is not a weaning process necessarily, it's just um, beginning to set some parameters around when and where you will nurse. Um, and again, having something special, I'm showing a Wiggles cup here as a special thing. So, you know, oh, you know, yes, we can go upstairs and nurse, or do you want to drink out of your Wiggles cup and, and read a book? So you can offer something special like that. Okay, just because you're continuing to nurse your older baby or toddler, it doesn't mean that you need to be up all night nursing. Um, a lot of people ask what they think are breastfeeding or weaning questions uh, about this, when in fact they're actually sleep association questions. There's, it's a sleep issue and not a breastfeeding issue. So even families where uh, mom is not breastfeeding, there will be and there can be ongoing nighttime uh, sleep issues that have nothing to do with the breast. So children uh, fall asleep, they wake up, and, an hour and a half later in a light sleep cycle, and hopefully we'll turn right back over and fall back asleep again. And we all have sleep associations. Children might suck their thumb or look for their lovey or thump their feet or talk to themselves at night. Uh, they may even sit up and play for a few minutes at night in their crib, and then hopefully eventually roll over and go back to sleep. But a child who only knows how to uh, fall asleep nursing will be looking for that several times a night. So uh, it can be useful to begin separating uh, feeding from falling asleep, nursing from falling asleep at the bedtime routine, uh, and to help your child learn some other sleep associations. You can also teach your child 
um, that that um, milk goes night night at night and that you just don't that's called night weaning that you just don't nurse between um, bedtime and morning wake up time. Uh, you may enjoy bed sharing and co sleeping and you may nurse two or three or four times throughout the night and not even notice and that's part of your parenting style and that's fine if it works for you and your family. You can put a sidecar or a toddler crib or a mattress. Um, a toddler bed, I meant, or a mattress um, on the floor in your room, or uh, if you're trying to transition your toddler into a crib or a toddler bed in his own room, you can put a mattress on the floor in there and spend a little bit of the beginning of the night in there until your child is asleep and then exit to your own bedroom. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this, and um, I referred you to the sleep webinar page, and if you need more detailed help, we do sleep consults as well. Uh, but it's a very common concern, it's a very common issue, and I have to emphasize it's not about nursing, it's about sleep associations, and there are many different ways that you can gradually shift or trade down or, um, or create new sleep associations as your baby gets older. Bedtime routines, as I mentioned, I think it's a really nice and freeing thing if uh, your partner or a family member or another caregiver is able to get your baby to sleep and you're not the only one that can put your baby down to sleep at night. And I remember when my kids were young, it really felt freeing to be able to um, nurse whichever child was the baby, hand the child over. I had a girl and a boy, so hand the kid over to my partner, my husband, um, and then he would do the rest of the bedtime routine and ultimately get the baby or the toddler or the preschool or whatever to sleep and I was done so I would do that last feeding and then hand the kids over and be done and um, I could go downstairs or watch TV or leave the house or go to sleep or do whatever but it feels very good to know that someone else can um, put your baby to sleep or your toddler to sleep and you're not required to be there uh, every time and um, as I mentioned earlier to separate feeding from the last thing that happens as your baby falls asleep is very useful. If your child at five and six months is starting to wake up more and more at night and not less and less, usually it's a sleep association issue. Nursing a toddler is very different. Here's more beautiful pictures sent in from um, Twitter moms. And um, nursing a toddler is different because it's usually um, short, it's distracted, it's, um, it's uh, Positions are very different, so you notice none of these are the very uh, common uh, having the baby latched on in the cross cradle position and so on. Uh, basically, anything goes as long as it's not hurting you. Babies do like to kind of come on and off, on and off, and if you're out in public, you can tell them um, that you're not going to keep nursing them if, if they're not settling down. So you can have, again, another phrase that you use consistently, um, like no wiggles, no wiggles, you're wiggling, no wiggles, and then you know you can end that feeding proactively. You can have different nursing behaviors that you'll permit at home, but you won't permit out of the home. Um, but you do not need to be a martyr to your growing child, so it's okay to set limits and follow through on them. Um, most most toddlers will nurse for short periods of time, except for uh, maybe you know a pre-sleep time, um, and uh, they do they do typically. Um, like to kind of come on and off and interact. So you can give them something to hold, um, a lovey uh, or you or the remote control here, uh, or you can read them a book or, or um, tell them a story or sing a song because um, they do tend to get a little bit distracted. And I love these pictures of toddler gymnastics. In fact, both of these children, I think, are pretty much in the same, they look like they're in the same position. And this is what I call being a sitting duck. Um, so, you know, if your child is accustomed to toddling over and coming on for, you know, for 30 seconds or a minute and then toddling off and doing something and coming back over, if you're okay with that, that's fine. Um, but that's not how nursing a toddler necessarily has to be. So you can have, you know, very, very discreet, uh, I don't mean discreet in terms of um, exposure. I mean very precise. You know, you can nurse before uh, in the morning when your baby wakes up. You can nurse before nap time, and you can nurse at bedtime, and you know, kind of keep it to to those types of um, of uh, contained scenarios if that's what you'd like to do. A lot of people that are nursing babies wonder, well, what about when the child has teeth? So it's common to think, oh, nursing a newborn, you know, nursing an infant, that I can wrap my mind around. But, you know, gosh, when, it, when a child has teeth, when a child can crawl, when a child can walk, when they talk, 
can talk and so on. But again, your baby is your baby. Um, he's just a week older and then another week older and another week older. And then one day they'll have a tooth and so on. The bottom teeth tend not to be so much of an issue because when the baby is latched properly, the tongue is covering the bottom teeth. The top teeth can create a little bit of irritation. And so that takes a little getting used to for both you and your baby. And there's some positioning tricks that can work to make you more comfortable. Um, biting is something that is um, both bad manners uh, that you can that you can uh, kind of uh, try to limit very quickly. Um, but typically biting occurs in the younger baby, say uh, uh, very common between eight and 12 months um, because they're about, because they are cutting a brand new tooth um, and they tend to get very nippy at that point. And that's also um, usually at the end of a feeding when they're kind of hanging out, hanging around. So you can proactively end the feeding yourself. You want to be very clear and firm about no biting. You don't want to uh, yell or yelp or scare your baby, but you do want to be firm about it. They're not doing it on purpose, even though they may um, smile or smirk when you uh, when you respond to it. Um, but uh, there are plenty of things you can do to help prevent the biting behaviors. And so I put a link to this webinar in here. So one, for example, would be starting around uh, four, five, six months, if your children does, does, don't have teeth yet, don't let them chew on your finger or your knuckle or your chin. So um, they don't understand why it's okay to gnaw on your index finger, but not on your nipple. And they also don't understand why it's okay for them to chew on your finger today, but not tomorrow when their tooth has cut through tomorrow and the, and the tooth is really sharp. So don't let them chew on any part of your body. Um, and give them, uh, I, I outlined some easy grasp teethers because for the five and six month old, it's hard to find a teether with a really satisfying chew. Um, I like the Winkle myself um, and Sophie the Giraffe and the Banana Brush. Those are some of my favorites for this purpose. Um, but they can chew on their own hands and they can chew on their own feet if they'd like, but they can't chew on anybody else. Uh, body parts. And so I do recommend watching this webinar before your babies have teeth because it will uh, give you some, some tips on how to prevent any issues and then how to deal with them as they arise. Because they do, babies do cut teeth and uh, they do get nippy around those times. Okay, a couple more topics and then this one's going to be wrapped up. Um, a lot of people will ask when they're nursing their 18-month-old about thinking ahead to the next baby. And especially if uh, you know, if you're in your 30s or, or older and you have to think about having uh, your children close in age and so on. And um, you certainly can get pregnant while you're breastfeeding. And in fact, many people um, get pregnant very early on in their breastfeeding experience because they don't realize that they are ovulating and they may actually become pregnant uh, without even realizing that their fertility has occurred. And that's um, often how you get babies that are uh, you know, somewhere around uh, a year to 18 months apart. Um, mom may or may not have even had her period back. So if it's important to you that um, that you don't have a surprise like that, I really encourage you uh, to, to be serious about birth control. And uh, if your baby is very young and you're not having a lot of sex regularly, then uh, a barrier method is probably a good way to go as opposed to a hormonal method. But that's up to you. We have, we can, that's a whole other topic. Um, and if this is being broadcast at Babies Are Us in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, then I don't want to talk about that too much right now. But we're talking about the return to fertility um, and uh, you can get pregnant while you're breastfeeding. But uh, I think somebody has asked about uh, lactation and amenorrhea and baby nurses on demand, continue nursing till two. Want a second baby? Okay, um, a lot of a lot of uh, women will get their period back when their baby starts sleeping in a longer stretch at night, or when they start to go uh, eight hours or more between nursing or pumping. So if your baby is still up uh, nursing two or more times at night, that may uh, that that may be what is uh, starting to that that may be what is preventing ovulation. Um, or not, but it may be. So one thing, if your if your child is over, uh, uh, you know, a year or 15 months, or and you want to start getting your period back and you haven't, um, I would probably consider uh, 
one cutting out one of those uh, night feedings, the first night feeding, and um, we can help you with that if that's of interest to you. But that way, your body will then go uh, probably you know seven to seven to ten hours or so if you nurse at seven, and then again at four or five a.m. Um, that may be enough over a month or two to uh, create your cycle starting back up again. Um, I mention uh, fertility treatments because that can be a sticking point. Uh, if if you did require fancy footwork to become pregnant, um, it would be nice if I could say, you know, oh, well, so many people do get pregnant, um, you know, surprisingly and easily uh, without IVF or uh, or medications and so on um, for the second baby. And that's true, but it's also a fantasy, you know, to say, oh, all of these people who had IVF the first time around won't need it again the second time around. Of course, that's untrue. Um, but um, fertility, fertility uh, physicians generally do want you to stop breastfeeding before they start um, doing your hormonal studies, using medications and talking about, um, you know, egg retrieval or uh, putting putting in um, putting in uh, doing IVF. Um, it's hard to negotiate that with them. They like to have such tight control over timing, uh, hormonal issues, and lab work, um, and they they really don't want any confounding factors going on. So it's that's a hard one to argue with. I would just think carefully about your you know child spacing and your age, and and not wanting to cut your toddler short in terms of your your breastfeeding plans. Um, but on the other hand, looking at the big picture of you know your family planning and and what what makes sense for you to do. Some people do nurse through pregnancy, that's called tandem nursing. Um, and when, when you nurse both the newborn and the toddler, um, and um, you have to pay very careful attention to your nutrition, uh, your own calcium and protein intakes. Of course, um, it's hard to rest when you're pregnant and have a toddler, but um, it, you know, you really do have to take care of yourself because you're growing three people, not two. Of course, your toddler is going to be more independent, um, eating other foods, not depending on you for nutrition. Um, but even so, you know, it's, it's, your body is doing a lot of work. Now, when you are pregnant, it does affect your milk production. So usually by uh, the first trimester, moms will have a lot of uh, breast tenderness and nipple discomfort. And sometimes that is a precursor uh, and she will decide to begin weaning right then. Um, other people will nurse through that and, um, and notice in the second trimester, milk production has uh, slowed or, or um, almost stopped dramatically because by the third trimester, your milk uh, will shift mostly to colostrum again. And so some toddlers will wean at some point early or mid-pregnancy because of the change in the quantity and the taste of the milk and, and um, and that will be enough for them to decide that they're not as interested. So some some moms are are eager to go along with that because um, you know they they don't have plans to nurse through pregnancy or tandem nurse. Tandem nursing, uh, you see in the picture here, you got a newborn and and um, looks like mom probably day four, day five, day six has a pretty full breast and her toddler is helping her out with that. So when you're tandem nursing, the newborn the baby comes first um, and then the toddler. And here's a gorgeous uh, photo from one of our regulars, Kara, who did a did an, a, a fantastic job uh, nursing her twins. And one weaned sooner than the other. And um, you know, I, I just remember talking about some of the emotional um, some of the emotional things as as your children do grow and change. Um, I love this picture because it looks like Elmo is looking over over uh, over the shoulder too. Um, but babies do grow up, and um, they're still your babies, and you may still want to continue breastfeeding them, and it's good for them, and it's good for you. And here's a little um, photo slide that I put in. Uh, that's I didn't put a link to the article about um, taking a pic taking pictures of your regular everyday breastfeeding pattern, but it's nice to do because now 16 years later, I'm glad that I have this photo, uh, which is really kind of funny because just like now, I'm on my bed with my laptop. Here, I'm not uh, on my bed right now. I'm at ISIS, but um, but every day when I leave ISIS, I go home and I sit on my bed with my laptop and answer more questions and you know read my email and so on. And that's what I did nursing my kids. And um, this is my, my younger, my baby, who's 16 now. Um, and uh, I think he was about 16 months old in that picture. Um, 
And um, somebody had asked me, no, we didn't have wireless 16 years ago, although my laptop looks shockingly uh, similar. It doesn't look any smaller right now than in this picture 16 years ago. But on the back of that laptop, there's a little box you can see, and that was called a roam about, and that was a precursor to Wi-Fi. Um, that was the first wireless uh, internet connection. And notice on the bedside table behind me, there's a little white baby monitor. Back in the old days, that's what the baby monitors were like. They were like radios, and you could just hear your child, but you couldn't see them. And I love all the nighttime uh, pictures that par parents send me on Twitter of the funny things that their babies are doing in the crib. And it amazes me how clearly you can see in the dark these, these images. I just love it. I wish I, wish I had that. Um, Oh, and then this is, and then there's Toby and I um, a month ago at his improv show at school. So, um, yeah, they do they do grow up and take pictures because uh, in the here and now it seems like an eternity, but it will it will go quickly. Here are some uh, other webinars that might be of interest to you. Oh, I meant to put the positive discipline one in here, uh, but I didn't. Um, but yes, we have webinars on um, feeding, on cups and straws and drinks. Thank you, Hillary. She's going to put the positive discipline one in there. Um, and um, gradual and partial weaning. So if you're interested in just doing night weaning, for example, um, or starting to set limits around breastfeeding, that webinar goes into it a little bit more. And then um, the sleep support program with the sleep webinars and sleep consults will be of interest to you. OK. Um, let's see. Uh, Tuesday, our sleep webinar topic is going to be uh, four to five month old sleep regressions, um, why babies start waking up more at five and six months, um, and why napping is so hard. And um, next Thursday, I think I'll just be doing all Q&A in the breastfeeding webinar. Please sign up for our newsletters, like us on Facebook, um, and follow the blog, follow us on Twitter. When you do these things, it helps us because um, you know, it helps build our list, uh, which justifies the time that myself and other people spend um, on things like these webinars and so on. All right, let's see if I can answer maybe just a couple questions and then we got to wrap up. One year old nurses morning and night still drinks 10 ounces of breast milk during the day while mom is at work wants to I want to decrease uh, at work pumping, but not lose supply or stop nursing. What is the best approach so I can maintain morning and evening nursing? And that I, that's a representative question. A lot of people had questions about this. Um, and let's see, one-year-old. So I don't know how often you are pumping at work, um, but someone else had asked earlier about pumping three times a day at work and, and um, for their over one-year-old. And you could try pumping twice during the day. You could also begin to, um, and then you may be able to you know, get down to pumping once during the day. So you're bringing home some, but not all the milk that your baby needs when you're away. And then if you're comfortable, you could begin um, adding in cow's milk as well. So you could, your child at childcare could drink, um, if, if he's drinking, 10 ounces of milk total, you could give him four ounces of express breast milk, which is what you pump from your one pumping session during uh, the afternoon at work the day before. And then um, later in the day, he could have four ounces of cow's milk and then you know another three ounces of cow's milk later. So you can do both breast milk and cow's milk. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, if I wouldn't expect that um, that all children are going to just quickly uh, gulp down cow's milk when it's offered straight the first time. So your baby may, but if not, then you want to do some of the, um, you know, the slow transition. So if you're doing a four ounce cup or a four ounce bottle, you would do four ounces of uh, breast milk, three ounces of breast milk, one ounce of maybe uh, try, you know, 1% um, cow's milk. And then if that goes well for a couple of uh, feedings or a day or two, then try 50-50. So two ounces of breast milk, two ounces of 1% cow's milk. Um, and then see if you can gradually get over to doing all 1% uh, cow's milk. And if your baby will drink that, then gradually move to 2% and then whole milk if that's what your pediatrician is recommending. So you can do it gradually that way. Okay, question from a mom. I did not get my period until my son was 11 months old. Now I'm late, but not pregnant. He comfort nursed more last month because of a cold and teething. Does this increase have an impact on my period? Does it take a few more months to become regular again? Yes, it's true that if um, if 
you are getting your period regularly and then nursing picks up dramatically for some reason, it can stave off ovulation. I would imagine that um, uh, it shouldn't stave it off for, you, you, I wouldn't think that you're going to have multiple months without ovulating again. So I think you will get your period back again and it will become uh, fairly regular again. Uh, however, it's probably wise to you say you're not pregnant, so I don't know if that means because um, it's not possible that you'd be pregnant or because you you did a pregnancy test and you weren't. Um, it's always a good idea to <laughs> recheck and if you haven't gotten your period back in a week, uh, pee on a stick again, just in case. Um, but yes, it's very, uh, it's not surprising that your cycle will be irregular or if your baby's nursing is irregular in the short term. Okay, last question. Um, only because we don't have time to get to them all, but I will answer questions next week. Um, I'm only, I'm interested in books and resources for nursing toddlers that don't just focus on weaning since I have a toddler with no interest whatsoever in stopping and I'm fine with that. Yes, I actually found that as well, that, um, that most of Oh, no, I, I remember talking in my weaning webinar that most of the books on weaning talked about really were focusing on um, why you shouldn't wean and, and so on and in the weaning webinar i went into it with the um with the uh idea with the thought that um that you're watching this webinar because you are either going to gradually wean or need to wean and so that's the information you want not an argument about why you shouldn't uh okay so i would recommend um um mothering your nursing toddler mothering your nursing toddler which is by somebody i think gramada or something like that um, I can find the link for you later and, and stick it in the in the chat room. Um, that's a I think it's been revised. That's a very it's an oldie but a goodie. It's probably initially from the 80s. It was um, came out from the La Leche League Press, of course, um, but a very good book. And I think it's been revised several times um, and kept current. Um, Mothering your nursing toddler. That's a good one. Um, Okay, and then yes, find um, find a support network. Um, La Leche League and some other breastfeeding networks usually have um, a nursing toddlers group. Um, and now I'm sure there's many groups online for that as well. Kelly Mom is a good resource. Um, most uh, attachment parenting type philosophy um, message boards will have a will have a section for nursing the older baby and toddler. And so just um, surrounding yourself with uh, with positive reinforcement uh, and suggestions on how to handle certain situations with family members and with, um, you know, with social events and things like that will be useful for you. Okay, I think we better wrap up because we went late. Um, thanks everybody for attending and I hope that uh, we'll see you back here. Uh, please help us spread the word on the webinars and the newsletters and so on. And thank you, Hillary, for being a great moderator today. Bye, everybody. <laughs>